Welcome, Nan. Thank you so much, Amita. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. So, so that's, I'm, yeah, go yes. ahead, please. I'm going to be talking with you today about weight gain or excess weight as a symptom, as a clue that something may be imbalanced in the body and the root causes in both the body and the mind. So in my practice, there are a couple of key concepts that I always bring in. Two of those are primary food and secondary food. Primary food is the food that nourishes our souls. And secondary food is the food that we eat. So among the primary foods, the first and foremost important one is our human connection, our relationships with others. Right now, we are challenged because of our social isolation. But the research shows that when you're with other people, especially when you're hugging people you love, you release the calming neurotransmitters, serotonin and oxytocin. And so I want to invite you all right now to do a little trick by yourself, a little self-care, where you can give yourself a hug and while you're there, just give yourself a little massage on the shoulders and see if it makes you feel a little calmer and a little happier. Because even when we do this ourselves, we do release those calming neurotransmitters. Other primary foods are a feeling of fulfilling a higher purpose, such as your career, your parenting, and even everyday kindnesses with others. Physical fitness, spirituality, and sleep are some other primary foods. Then we have secondary food, as I mentioned, that is our food that we consume, our nutrition. We always look at that. So I'm gonna start by telling you my health story, my personal story, and what led me to become a health coach. When I was in my 30s, my husband and I moved from New York to San Francisco to the Bay Area with our two small boys. And our deal was we'd come out here for about two years for my husband's career. Well, that turned into four years, six, and so on. And while I loved being a mom and I loved uh, my life at home, I was not putting down roots in the Bay Area and I was having a hard time making friends and I was feeling pretty resentful. I started to have some strange symptoms, pain between my shoulder blades, uh, joint pain, a numb tongue and toe, and uh, night sweats and some brain fog. I went to a rheumatologist who took my blood and diagnosed me with the autoimmune disease lupus as well as arthritis. He wanted me to take a steroid. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to discover what was behind this. Why did I have these symptoms all of a sudden? So I have a science background and I went to the web and began researching in the peer reviewed journal articles, my symptoms. And one thing kept coming up over and over again, and that was gluten. And this was before gluten was in the mainstream media. So I, I found a friend with celiac disease who taught me how to go 100% gluten free. I learned that it could take up to six months to feel any relief, if at all. And sure enough, 100% gluten-free at the six month mark, all of my symptoms disappeared. I went back to my doctor who saw that I no longer had the blood markers for these diseases. And this was really quite miraculous and a real awakening for me in terms of the power that our food has on our health. So I began to look at the way I was feeding my family. I had to uh, check labels often. So I noticed all of the ingredients that I, you know, we can't even pronounce that are in our foods. I threw out the bagel bites, the uh, hamburger helper, all the processed foods and began cooking more from scratch and buying organic. Lo and behold, my boys, both of whom had some irritable bowel uh, symptoms had digestive um, enhancement. They felt better. And my husband lost 60 pounds over a year. Meanwhile, at the same time, I also was pursuing some 
uh, personal development workshops because of my resentment feelings. And these helped me to have a very different perspective on my life. I began to really feel grateful for the beautiful Bay Area, for my life in general. My marriage improved and I began to make friends and feel confident in living here. And I do believe that both these primary foods, the mind and the body, and what I was eating and secondary foods, both enhanced my health. And that's why I'm still having good health today. That's amazing. You're still in San Francisco. You didn't move back. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it now. That, that's great. That's great. <laughs> All so, right. Well, I see a lot of different change motivators that bring clients to me. Maybe it is weight, excess weight. That's frequently the uh, symptom people want to change. Sometimes it's fatigue. Sometimes it's changes with libido. Um, sometimes it's relationship issues, digestive health, headaches, pain, numbness, maybe even a diagnosed disease like diabetes or a thyroid condition, and so on. These symptoms are all the body's messages of dis-ease in the body before it becomes disease. And whether or not we're approaching the uh, root causes of disease or disease, in all of these cases, we can make a difference. Often, we can even reverse the symptoms. The root causes of all of these are always physiological and mental emotional stressors that cause changes in our biochemistry. So we have to look at stress and how it impacts our weight and our health from both the mind and the body perspective. We look at the HPA-TG axis, that's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal thyroid gonadal axis. In other words, it's just the messages coming from the brain to our endocrine glands. And chronic stress is, uh, if we're in a state of chronic stress, we're in a state of sympathetic dominance, which is fine in the short term, but not in the long term not chronically. That is our fight or flight uh, nervous system state. Cortisol, which is released when we're stressed, is a master hormone. And it can have an impact on our thyroid gland, which affects our metabolism. And it can cause insulin resistance, which causes our blood sugar to rise and causes fat retention in the body. Not to mention cortisol's impact on our immune system. But the body does this on purpose when we're in chronic fight or flight. If you look at it from an evolutionary perspective, our ancestors who might have had to run from a saber-toothed tiger, um, if they were in this fight or flight, run and hide state, the body doesn't know if, if, it, if you're going to have fuel uh, in the future. So it holds on to this excess weight as a uh, as a, a survival mechanism for energy. When we're talking about stress, we also look at gut health. So we look at our nutrients. Of course, we look at what we're eating, but also how we are digesting. There are many variables that cause people to either uh, digest well or not digest well, including stomach acid, digestive enzymes, and so forth. And there are many things that can impact um, our the, our stomach acid, such as aging, very commonly people have lower stomach acid above the age of 60. Uh, and if, if we're not digesting well, we may not be getting enough nutrition. We also may be digesting well, but not absorbing those nutrients for various reasons into the cells. And then when we look at gut health, we also want to look uh, through stool testing at various pathogens that may be present like candida or H. pylori. We also want to look at uh, infections, viruses, and the state of your microbiome. There are several microbe types uh, among the trillions of microbes that make up the microbiome in our gut. Several of these microbes actually have an impact on our weight. We also want to look at the quality of our food versus the quantity. Now, you know, we talk about calories in and calories out equals 
weight stabilization? Well, in many cases that is true, but in some cases it's not. And for example, if you were to take the same number of calories of broccoli versus chocolate cake, they would have a very different impact on the body through our hormones and a very different impact on our weight. So we look at the quality of the food that you're ingesting. As, and in addition to what you're eating, we would like you, for you to be eating real whole foods as opposed to processed foods. In other words, food that looks on your plate the way it does in nature. That's real foods um, and not processed foods. We also want to look at how much sugar is in your food because the American Heart Association recommends no more than six teaspoons of added sugar a day for women and nine teaspoons a day for men. And how that translates into grams, which you can look at on your labels, is 24 grams for women, 36 grams for men. And also we look at, um, you know, are you eating too much refined flour? We really, that's not great for any of us, uh, as well as alcohol. Refined flour, for example, would be in baked goods, bagels, pizza, and so forth. Both refined flour and alcohol are very quickly broken down into sugar through digestion. And we also wanna consider food sensitivities, like I have a sensitivity to gluten, and there are many other sensitivities out there that impact our digestion and our inflammation throughout the body. I'll be talking more about that. We also wanna look at toxins we're exposed to. Uh, obesogens, the term obesogens is a, is a real thing now. These are the toxins that we're exposed to in our home environment, uh, through our body products and our water and so forth. I'll talk more about those in a few minutes. And then the toxins in our air, in our food, uh, the chemicals and pesticides and herbicides and so on, as well as medication. While medication is important um, you know, for acute care, um, regardless of how long you're taking it, it's always a toxin. The, the liver has to purge medication, just like any toxin. And uh, I put here antibiotics and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as Advil, because these two types of medication in particular have a very major impact on the, both the microbiome and the gut lining. So we all know the expression, you are what you eat, and similarly, you are what you think. What we believe and what we think has an impact on our hormones, on our epigenetics, uh, which is the study that's been around for about 20 years of the expression of our genes. In fact, it turns out that only about 15% uh, of our genes are fixed and the other 85% are malleable. They are impacted in their expression by our beliefs, by our behavior and uh, our environment. And, uh, you know, our thoughts really do shift our physiology. The body follows the mind as a way to cope with the environment in which we are asking it to live. So it also, uh, what we think has an impact on inflammation throughout the body. And there were a couple of interesting studies I just wanted to mention. One was on some study subjects who were making comparisons in their minds comparing themselves to others, desperately wanting to fit in. And what they found is that these people had a, uh, an impact on their inflammation markers in a negative way. And there's another study out of uh, Brandeis University that found that with self-compassion, the subjects had a positive impact on their inflammation markers. Then we wanna look at your sleep and your exercise, which have a huge impact on how you think and feel. And we wanna look at portion control. And I have this under what you think because frequently I'll give my clients an exercise in putting a pad of paper near their refrigerator because some, many people go back to get seconds, second helpings, mindlessly. And oftentimes there are emotions underneath that behavior. And if we just stop 
and ask ourselves, why am I going back for more food? What emotion is underneath this? And write that down. It can make us aware and increase our self-awareness of what we're thinking and feeling that's behind that behavior. Okay. So we want to, you want to ask yourself, what foods are working for me? I talked about food sensitivities. And um, the, the real gold standard of figuring out if you have a food sensitivity is a food elimination trial. This is a 21-day trial of eliminating the most commonly uh, uh, known foods to be triggers and then reintroducing them one at a time. And if you want to try this yourself, uh, in my book, Gutsy, I have a very st uh, clear step-by-step -step plan so that you can do that and figure out for yourselves what you might be intolerant to. And um, you can find my book on my website, which is nanfosterhealth.com on the homepage. It turns out food sensitivities are reported in 20% or more of the population. But in fact, likely many more than that because these are just the reported cases. And many, many people walk around without knowing that they have sensitivities. If you have a food sensitivity, it's a source of stress on the body. It can dysregulate digestion, uh, wreak havoc on the immune system, and cause inflammation. And when you have a sensitivity, you have difficulty digesting certain compounds, especially the proteins found in foods like milk, eggs, wheat, or soy. So a food allergy is a little different. We're familiar with a peanut allergy, for example. It's an acute reaction. The immune system is closing the throat, for example. Uh, but a food sensitivity takes a few days to feel a reaction. It's a, it's a delayed onset. And you may not find, feel it until one or two days later, which makes it kind of tricky to figure out what the culprit is. But you do have signs of inflammation. You do have a, an increased cortisol, which is very likely. And again, cortisol has an impact on insulin often which raises our blood glucose and causes weight gain. With, an immune, uh, with a uh, food sensitivity, you can also have a leaky gut, which causes all kinds of other problems throughout the body, including autoimmune diseases. So I mentioned obesogens before, and you can see in all the, the red lettering here, all of the, or many of the obesogens that we come in contact with on a daily basis through our food, the organophosphates that are sprayed on the food, uh, through our toothpaste, if you're using fluoride toothpaste, through our plastic bottles, you get BPA and on the lining of cans and so on. And uh, these obesogens have a physiological effect on the thyroid gland. And again, the thyroid gland is responsible for our metabolism and our energy. They also mimic estrogen in the body. And the higher our estrogen level, the more likely we are to gain weight. And ironically, when we gain fat, fat cells also make estrogen by themselves. So it's a vicious cycle. And in this photo, you can see that there's some adipose tissue right in the belly. When this happens because of these obesogens, it's a good clue that we may also be laying down fat in our cardiovascular system which can obviously be dangerous. Uh, the obesogens promote insulin resistance, again, causing blood sugar to rise. And when insulin is constantly present, it tells our bodies to store fat. We increase the number and the size of our fat cells, and we can have non-alcoholic fatty liver, NAFL, which is just like a fatty liver that you would see in a chronic alcoholic. Uh, we also have an increase in triglycerides and our LDL cholesterol as a result of these obesogens. And they also disrupt the hormones that regulate satiety and appetite. I want to give you some good news, though, after all that. Our bodies are incredible machines, and they detox naturally the way that our hearts beat without us thinking about it and our lungs breathe without us thinking about it. Our bodies are always detoxing through the cells of the liver, 
the lungs, and the kidney. We detox through stool, urine, sweat, and breath. And we detox through a process called methylation, which is ongoing. Some people have genetic variants that cause an issue with methylation. And in, in those cases, in, in these clients of mine, we use some specific supplements that bypass that problem. Whether you have a methylation problem or not, this exposure that is so constant for us can cause us to go into toxic overload. But again, our bodies are so brilliant that they uh, hold on to mucus and fat to house those toxins and keep them away from vital organs. And we can actually gain up to 15 extra pounds because of this. So what do we do about all this? We want to remove the inflammatory offenders. So you can discover your hidden food intolerances, as I mentioned before, through an elimination trial. Or there are tests that are quick uh, to find out if you have one as well. And those are fairly accurate these days. You can re remove the inflammatory issues through your food as well, removing the herbicides and pesticides, the preservatives and so forth, all the excess sugar and the bad fats, the inflammatory fats that are found in trans fats, uh, in processed foods, and in the yellow corn, soy, and seed oils. One way to um, help yourself is to go organic as much as possible with your food. And I recommend if you can't afford to go all organic, all organic, because it is a strain on the budget, that you look to a website by the environmental working group called ewg.org and pull down, you can download the dirty dozen list and the clean 15 list and take them to the grocery store. These are the lists that tell you which produce you can buy uh, you can get away with buying that is not organic, that retains the least amount of pesticide, and which ones you really do need, you really do need to buy organic. And they update this each year. You want to get rid of the uh, obesogens in your life by using um, glass instead of plastic uh, or metal for drinking. And um, I'm just going to take a sip, actually. Uh, using glass containers for your food, using body products that are 100% toxin free. Our skin is our biggest organ and the toxins actually go right into the bloodstream through the skin in 23 seconds. We want to um, change out our nonstick pans to make sure that they are free of PFOA and PTFE and there are many other things we can do. Um, cleaning products that are green and non-toxic. And we also want to remove a sedentary lifestyle. Moving obviously makes us feel better, but also it moves our lymphatic system, which helps us to detox. So we want to add in, that's what we want to remove. Here's what we want to add in. We want to add in the healing foods. Again, we want to go organic as much as possible and particularly with your proteins, uh, your meat, your, your fish, your uh, eggs and dairy, because the conventionally, far especially in America, the conventionally farmed animals are loaded with hormones and antibiotics and their feed is covered with pesticide and herbicide. So I always um, tell clients that they should certainly go organic with their meat and dairy. We want to add in lots of plant foods, which are higher in filling fiber than meat, dairy, and processed foods, obviously. And they have loads of essential nutrients for our energy, hormone balance, our satiety, for our microbiome, for good bowel movements, and for disease prevention. And we want to add in healthy fats. We now know, uh, which we didn't know years ago, that fat is not only good for us, it's essential. And, um, these healthy fats include avocados, coconut oil, uh, nuts and seeds, olive oil and olives. And this is very important for our brains as they are made up of 60% fat. Also important for our hearts, our cellular function, our nerves, 
It's important for us to absorb our fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, and for our hormone production, and for our fat metabolism, believe it or not, and for our weight stabilization, our thyroid function, and cholesterol balance. Again, clean proteins, as I just mentioned, uh, we add in, and in addition to um, them being organic, what's great about protein is that they make the body produce glucagon, which is a hormone that causes us to burn fat. As compared to refined carbohydrates, uh, like you know the carbs I mentioned earlier made with flour, refined flour, that causes us to produce the hormone insulin, which causes us to store fat. We wanna drink filtered water. Filtering will obviously take out a lot of the toxins, but also if you feel hungry during the day, it may be because you're dehydrated. Dehydration mimics hunger oftentimes. And in order to keep your blood sugar stable throughout the day and avoid the spikes and uh, troughs that cause us to feel hungry and irritable, just remember the magic formula. If you eat clean protein plus fiber from plants, plus healthy fat at each meal, that is the way to stabilize blood sugar and address your weight and your health all at the same time. We also wanna add in healing primary foods. So you wanna feed your soul, spending time with friends and family, having laughter and joy in your life, physical activity and spirituality and a satisfying career all feed you and a lack of primary foods actually creates a reliance on secondary edible foods and overeating. You wanna add in good quality sleep and resting and relaxing because when you're sleep deprived or stressed, you will crave energy, causing cravings for sugary snacks and caffeine. That's what that two o'clock slump is all about. Sleep is the foundation for all healing. And you wanna exercise regularly. It reduces our stress, decreases our insulin sensitivity, especially when we exercise the large muscles in the legs. Actually increases, should say increases our insulin sensitivity, decreases our insulin resistance. And of course, exercise enhances our mood. But if you're somebody who is used to very strenuous exercise daily, Less may be more for you because over-exercising can actually dysregulate our adrenal glands, which are the glands that produce cortisol. So again, putting stress on the body. And this can also impact blood glucose and digestion. Choose mind-body practices you love, like meditation, yoga, maybe going out in nature, and get support. If you feel overwhelmed, you can talk with a friend, obviously, reach out to a coach, or maybe seek out a therapist. And that's what I have today. Now, do we have time to talk about uh, a couple of client cases? Absolutely. Yes, yes, absolutely. Please okay. go ahead. So Steve uh, was a young man who came to me, he was 29, and he wanted to lose 40 pounds in 10 months because in 10 months he was going to get married. Um, he, it turns out through discussions and coaching, we found, figured out that he was sleeping very poorly uh, in part because of his very stressful workload. On top of his stressful job, he also owned, a, he was a partner in a business that was a brewery. So after his regular job, he would go to the brewery on many nights to entertain people there uh, and he would always have alcohol all night long. In fact, he felt compelled to have beer in his hand. He was a coffee addict, drinking it all day long. So not only does that put more stress on the body, but it's also dehydrating. And it, uh, with its tannins, pulls nutrients out of the body. Um, he was stress eating. He relied on a huge bag of pretzels on his desk. And as I mentioned, he had lots of alcohol and he wasn't exercising at all. So little by little, we chipped away at his behaviors and added in some new healthy ones, which started to make him feel better. 
he went organic, he committed to being completely organic in his food and mostly plant-based. He wasn't eating a whole lot of vegetables before, now he brought them in. Uh, he started to have healthy fats. Uh, he, he added some MCT oil, medium chain triglyceride oil, to his one espresso a day. That's what we agreed on. He was happy to try that. And that did the trick. It filled him up. It made him feel like he could have his coffee and have a little treat. And with his breakfast that was, again, a clean protein, fiber, and some healthy fat, though the espresso and the breakfast took him all the way to lunch without needing a snack. And then he repeated that behavior again for lunch and dinner. He added in lots of clean water and he began to exercise weekly, three times a week. He felt better and better. He discovered he actually liked to exercise. And he was cooking with his fiance, which of course, in and of itself is primary food, uh, you know, enjoying that together. He actually reached his goal before his wedding and obviously that delighted both of us. That's amazing. Yeah. Susie is a woman in her 50s and she came to me with two primary goals. One was to lose 10 pounds and two was to have greater energy. It's funny because she has tremors, but she didn't come to me for that. Uh, but through discussion about her tremors and when they started, we figured out that they began soon after she had a whole lot of silver fillings removed from her mouth. Well, silver fillings release mercury into the body. And when you have them removed um, inappropriately and all at once by a regular dentist uh, or one who doesn't know how to do this appropriately to protect you from the mercury, you can get a big load, a whopping dose of mercury in your body. And soon after her tremors started. Uh, so we began to put her on a detox protocol. And in, in addition to that, which was a supplementation protocol, we realized, she realized that her headaches seemed to be associated uh, surprisingly with sugar, not with the mercury. So we reduced her sugar as well as her coffee, which were not helping her tremors or her energy. Um, it turns out she ha does have a known gene variant, like I mentioned earlier, that causes her to have problems with her methylation. So she was holding on to these toxins. She was uh, every single week going on several 10 to 50 mile bike rides with a group of uh, powerhouse women. And though that is in and of itself wonderful because you know these friends got to be together, it proved to be too much on her nervous system at times. And she pulled back a bit and began to feel more and more energy such that when she went on her next big bike ride, she was, she was all alone in the, in the trail and she thought, I thought I was feeling better. What happened? Where is everybody? I, am I that far behind them? And it, it turned out she was ahead of them. She was so surprised, she couldn't wait to tell me. They were all behind her and they came up just a few minutes later. So her energy really did increase. Um, we changed her food to be organic and again, mostly plant-based, healthy fats to support her nervous system, which in her case was essential. And she added in calming practices that she hadn't been using before, which was a good counterfoil to all of her uh, strenuous exercise, yoga and deep breathing. We started her on intermittent fasting, which is a great um, uh, boost for the microbiome. It's been shown in the research to help with weight loss and uh, insulin sensitivity. It also, um, uh, it also is an enhancement for detoxing. And she really, really enjoys intermittent fasting. She saw huge results very quickly with it. Um, we discovered through some blood work that she has a low thyroid. And as a result, she probably has some low stomach acid. The two are connected. And uh, we figured this out because even though she's supplementing with various nutrients, she was still low in these in her blood work. So we added in some apple cider vinegar to uh, her daily routine with each meal. And lo and behold, she lost even more weight. So that was a clue that now she was digesting better and getting more nutrition, as well as it has an impact on blood sugar. 
So another great success story. That's, that's amazing. Um, I just uh, wanted to ask a question. You talked about your second client, uh, you added intermittent fasting. So what kind of intermittent, what is the interval that you guided her to eat? Yeah. Uh, how many hours after, uh, of that? Right. So that's a good question. Intermittent fasting can look different for different people. Mm -hmm. um, the research shows it, it can have d different methods even throughout the day. But I talk with my clients about the 12 hour interval of fasting between dinner and breakfast or 14 hours or 16 hours. And I let them choose what works for them. In her case, she's pretty gung ho. <laughs> She did yeah. the 16 hours and that's what worked for her. But that's great. That's great. Well, thank you so much uh, for, for being with us. Um, you know, I hope uh, our viewers enjoyed this session. If there are any questions, we had written our email and um, also our website. You're welcome to um, send us the questions later on. I know it's Friday afternoon. Most of the people are working at this time. But, you know, you can view this uh, recording um, afterwards and feel free to ask us any questions. With that, I'd like to wrap up. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Nan, any, any last comments from you before I wrap up? No, just thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much.